Thank you, Dave Honor. Thank you very much for the organisers for inviting me. And um, thank you especially for letting me to send in an abstract, which is the longest by some distance of any of the abstracts, <laughs> even including the mini courses. So, some people would say I wasn't compensated. But, um, so, the, um, right, so the first thing to say is if you're in the audience, don't worry so much about this, especially don't worry if you can't read the writing. I'll explain this a little bit. The red writing is more important than the white stuff. Um, <coughs> if you're watching from the camera, then I'm going to sort of dramatically draw that across at the end, so it all will be revealed. Um, okay, so first of all, I want to draw a diagram which is probably very well known to most of the audience, I don't have enough space, I think this is a, and this is similar to the diagram that's on the, um, the small blackboard, um, so that relates to nil potent orbits in, um, in F4, but here I've got a diagram relating to uh, nil potent orbits in uh, GL6 and I don't quite that space for the model but you can sort of see what's going on so the way I've written this is where um, we're using the partition type classification of nil potent orbits so another way of thinking about this diagram is it is the Hasse diagram of partitions of six with the dominance order on partitions. And one of the reasons I've drawn this diagram is because if you can see that there are three things at the bottom here, there's quite a striking symmetry of the diagram between the top and the bottom. You can turn this upside down, and anybody who knows partitions knows what that's about. It's the dual partition which is turning this diagram upside down. So in fact, it's not so much a symmetry of the diagram, it's an anti-symmetry, because these are ordered pairs where the one that's above is greater in the partial order than the one that's below. Right? So we have an anti-symmetry of the diagram. Where it sends a partition lambda to its transpose partition lambda transpose. Okay, and of course partitions, as I said at the beginning, are related to nil potent orbits in GLN, or more generally in the other classical types too. And so the partial order on partitions of N and that's the dominance order on partitions is related to the closure order um, on nil potent orbits in GL. Right. Okay, so what's happening here? Well, if you have a lambda. So lambda has parts, lambda 1, lambda 2, etc. And you can form uh, a nil potent element in Jordan normal form, which has Jordan box of size lambda 1, lambda 2, lambda 3. And so we're going to denote this orbit, um, the orbit of that element by O lambda. And we're saying that lambda is greater than or equal to mu if and only if the closure of O lambda contains O mu. Okay, so the partial order is very closely related to these nil potent orbits, but the duality um, can be expressed very simply by a different way of thinking about these partitions. And that's if you pick a partition lambda, then you can produce an irreducible representation for corresponding symmetric group 
And there's an obvious duality on this set of irreducible representations, which comes from tensoring with the sign. Okay? So this uh, anti-symmetry or duality is very easy to write down in terms of the representations of the symmetric group. The partial order is more easy to write down in terms of these nilpotent orbits. Uh, this uh, duality can be expressed in terms of the nilpotent orbits too using induction uh, from a, a, the relevant Levy subalgebra up to the part of the algebra, but I don't really have time to talk about that. Okay, so there's a story to tell here. And that's to briefly explain what um, The equivalent of this picture is for other types. And so this is listed stuff inside of duality. And that's it. Um, Task one and then task two is to explain uh, the duality is manifested geometrically in relation to edges. in the Haas diagram and not just vertices. Uh, let me just so let me just say what I mean by that. So here we've got all the partitions of six and we pick the given partition, which is given by a node in the graph or a vertex in the graph. And then we've applied the transpose to get another vertex in the graph. Well, you could do the same thing on edges. You pick an edge here, and you clearly have a dual edge, which is the other way around, up above at the other end of the passive diagram. So the manifestation of duality holds uh, in some sense that I hopefully will be able to explain the relation to edges and not just the uh, vertices here. OK. OK, so for one, um, OK, so what would be the equivalent of this picture here, where we're taking an irreducible representation, V lambda, given by your partition lambda, and we're tensoring with the sign? Well, for other simple Lie algebras, you also have the corresponding vial group, and you also have a sign representation of the violent group, which is a non-trivial one-dimensional representation. So we can clearly take, replace our SN here by any vial group W and tensor with the sign and get a, an order to bijection on the set of irreducible representations. Okay, so the natural way, way to try and link up this picture with nilpotent orbits and irreducible representations of W in other types is to use the Springer correspondence. So I'm just going to very briefly explain the idea. So the correspondence associates are just for representations 
called W, and this is the vial group of G. Uh, to local systems on the potent orbits. So let's try the following. Picking an orbit O. And now we're going to apply the Springer correspondence to the trivial local system on this O. I think I should clarify somewhere. Front field is C. C is a simple Lie algebra. And all orbits are no potent orbits. And probably some other things that I need to record. Okay, so given an orbit O, we produce an irreducible representation which is associated to the trivial local system on this O, then tensor with the sign then try to reverse the Springer correspondence So we're trying to reverse the Springer correspondence to get that the sign tensored with this row O1 should be row of some other orbit on the trivial local system on that. So the question is, is sign tensor row O1 <coughs> equal to row of some orbit 1 for some B of O? And the answer is no. Okay. The answer is no. But if O is, is a special no potent orbit, <coughs> and then you have to exclude three special cases. Special is okay. So special, the special orbits are a subset of the nil potent orbits, and they're defined in terms of these numbers that must be associated to the nil potent orbits using the spring protocol. So there's an A and there's an A tilde, and special means A equals A tilde, and you also have some numbers B and B tilde, and the exceptional ones are the ones where A plus B is not equal to A tilde plus B tilde. Okay. So it's a kind of a, a mysterious one, at least for me this is a mysterious thing, 
but we have this sort of set of rules that are giving you a certain set of orbits which have nice properties in some ways, even when you look at a supposedly unrelated question like the geometry of the nil potent planet. But these exceptional nil potent orbits kind of pop up as really like the uh, objects of great interest, to we say. Yeah. For GL6, is each one a special? Every orbit is special in my time. I was going to say that, yes. Okay, so in type A, all orbits are special. And then I can also give you the rules in types B and C. So our lambda is special if and only if the transpose is also an orbit in the same Lie algebra. So So orthogonal in the case that we're in type B and symplectic in the case that we're in type C. Okay, and in type D things get to put on A. Right, okay, so if you exclude these cases here, so there's one in type E7, and then there are two in type E8, well you don't exclude them, but if you just deal with these in an ad hoc way, then this sort of description that I've given you above, of applying the Springer correspondence and then tensioning with the sign, gives you a duality, so an order reversing involution, on the set of these special Lopatin orbits. And because there's only one in type E7, and there are two in type E8, and they naturally fit into the gaps, so they're dual to each other in the, when you apply this kind of process, I don't know. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, probably. I mean, what happens here is you have a non-trivial local system, and so on, on A4 plus A1, for example, when you tensor with the sign, trivial local system gets sent to the non-trivial local system. And the same thing in E8, but it also swaps the two orbits. So. But I don't have the answer to your question. So we have an order reversing bijection on the set of special no orbits. orbit. So this particular diagram here, um, you can see that the white lines um, give you a Hasse diagram which is symmetric, it actually looks very similar to the, to the type A5 diagram that I drew before, but that's a coincidence. Um, the, what's written in here doesn't really matter, these are just the labels that we use to describe these nil potent orbits. Um, so but what's important is that I can flip this diagram upside down and I get the same diagram. Right? And a bit later on I'll try and explain what the red letters refer to. Okay, so that's, um, this is Lustig Bunkenstein duality. The, the description I've given here, Daniel pointed out, is not historically accurate. So, somehow special Milpotent orbits were developed at the same time as the duality which the Bunkenstein was looking at. So. Okay. Um, so let me just write down that uh, so if O1 is more than O2, um, 
and this is a pair of nilpotent orbits in some Lie algebra. And the corresponding duals, d of O2 is greater than d of O1. Now there's one more fact that I forgot when I was practicing running through this talk, and I realized later I need to mention. In this talk, we use the version of duality that swaps type B and C. So, right, so if, you, if I had a Hasse diagram for the special orbits of Bn, I would be turning that upside down and getting the special orbits of type C and vice versa. That appears later on. Okay. Um, but your duality of special orbits doesn't switch time. Sorry? But the duality of special orbits doesn't switch time. Uh, it, you can you have two different versions. So BN and CN have the same vial group. So they're essentially the same. So when you look at the special nilpotent orbits, which are defined in terms of the representations, we get the same set. Type B or type C. So you can have an order preserving bijection between those two things, or you can have an order reversing one. And so the duality in our case is reversing the order by going from type B to type C. That's the same set. Can one define the order just in terms of representations of the value? I think it's order. mostly a coincidence that it turns out to be the same graph, right? Uh, I don't know the reason. Yeah, I, I don't. I, it's, uh, <laughs> so for BSC, it's the same process as a process? Yeah, yeah. So you can make them correspond. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the post set for B, is it symmetric? Sorry? Post set for B, is it symmetric? Yes. Yes, yeah. That's, yeah. So in all, in all types, it's symmetric, so or anti-symmetric. I just need a few facts about nilpotent orbits. So in all terms, <coughs> if we're looking at the set of nilpotent orbits, and I'll come and deal with the special nilpotent orbits in a moment, there is a unique maximal element And that unique maximal element is the regular nilpotent orbit. So there's a unique next to maximal element. And this is the subregular nilpotent orbit. Uh, there's obviously a unique minimal, which is just the zero orbit. This is contained in the closure of every other nilpotent orbit. And there's a unique next to minimal nilpotent orbit, which is called slightly confusingly the minimal nilpotent orbit. And it's the orbit of the highest grid element. Um, so, what that's saying is that the Hasse diagram of all nilpotent orbits. Looks something like the following. Right at the top, you've got your maximal element, then you've got the subregular, 
and at the bottom you've got O min and a single edge to zero. And now O rank, O sub rank, and zero are special in all types. O min is special in simply based cases. But even in the non simply based cases, there's always a unique minimal non zero special nil potent orbit. And the minimal non zero special orbit is as follows. The orbit of a short root element in types Pn, Cn, and F4, and it's just the subregular null potent in type G2. Right? So this is sometimes labeled G2A1. Okay. And so, um, let me just say a little bit about where this problem came from. So, Danielle and um, Eric Sommers and Bawa Fu and I um, were interested in studying certain singularities which are associated to edges in the Hassett diagram of all nil potent orbits. Um, and this was, in the classical types, was earlier, earlier work of Kraft and Pachesi. So, we were interested in extending their work to exceptional cases. And so we're interested in studying what happens when you pick a nil potent orbit and then one which is in its closure, but which is as close to being in that orbit as possible without actually being in it. So another way of saying that is you pick a nil potent orbit closure and then take the complement of that orbit in its closure and pick one of the irreducible components of that and then try and study the geometry of the original nil potent orbit closure at a point which is in a dense orbit in an irreducible component. Okay, I don't have time to write all that down, so let me just uh, give two special cases which are very well known. Singularities to be associated to edges in the Hasse diagram. So let's start with the one right at the bottom. Are you always considering special edges? For the moment, I'm just talking about arbitrary orbits, and then I'll explain how to then go to special orbits. It's a slight adjustment of what I'm saying now. So we start with the edge right at the bottom. And the singularity associated to this is just the nil potent orbit closure only in part. Right? This is called a minimal singularity. It was called a minimal singularity, I think, after Pachesi point that. Um, term. This is a minimal singularity and we denote it AN, CN, CN, etc. Right? So small letters to denote minimal. And when we say singularity, we also write variety. Sorry? When you say singularity, what do you mean? Algebraic yes, yeah, well, uh, so technically, yes, it's an algebraic variety. We take the, uh, uh, analy the equivalence class up to analytic isomorphism. Mm -hmm. Another way of saying it is you take the completed local ring 
Okay, and I think I'll, I'll, um, I'll just say it now, um, uh, we're on this topic. So what about uh, the minimal special orbit closure uh, outside the ADP cases? And so there's a really nice result of Berlinski and Custance. And I meant to check the air, but I forgot to. And this result comes from thinking about universal covers of nilpotent orbits. So a nilpotent orbit is a complex manifold, and you can describe the fundamental group in terms of the central matter in the corresponding simply connected group. And so you can use this description to find the ring of um, regular functions on something you could describe as the affine closure of the universal cover of the Milpoden no orbit. And when you do this in these particular cases of the minimal Milpoden no orbits in the simulated types, you get a quite surprising result. which is that the minimal special no-potent orbit closure in a non simply based case is isomorphic to um, the quotient of uh, minimal in SL2N by, uh, sorry, this is wrong, CN. So what have we got here? We've got a, a minimal singularity of type A2n minus 1, and then you have an outer action by uh, an outer involution of SL2n. And if you quotient by that action, then you get the minimal special of the potent orbit in SP2n. So you can do something similar to type Pn, and this is going to be Dn plus 1 over S2. And then for type S4, we won't surprise you that we've got E6 over S2, for that G2, we've got D4, uh, quotiented by uh, group S3. Okay? So, um, so in other words, these minimal special normal closures in any type can be described in terms of these minimal singularities, but possibly quotiented by a finite group. So the universal closure of the Sorry? Sorry, you take a, one of these orbits over here. Uh, so, and then you take the universal cover of that orbit. Essentially, you take um, the, the universal cover of that is going to close up to some affine variety. And um, uh, what do you have from type C2? Sorry? Well, what kind of similarity do you have from type C2? Type C2, yes. Um, it's, yeah, it's A3 over S2. Is it the same as D4? No, it's the same as D3. Sorry? It's D3. 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 But when you factor out by S2? It becomes different. I mean, when you factor by S2, do you get G4? A3 is really the same thing as D3. Yeah. Yes, I know, but when you when you take caution and the reaction of S2, so it's no longer A3. It's A3 factored by S2, isn't it? Mm -hmm. so for but the, my question is, is it the same as D4? No, no, it's not. It's different by S2. Okay. So I don't want to get distracted behind already. Okay, so 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 in the Hasse diagram of all of the special no-partner orbits, we have this edge right at the bottom. 
and way at the bottom, we have one of these singularities for either a n, d n, d6, d7, d8. So we have one of the simplest case. So Singularity associated to this edge at the top uh, is, comes from comes from the free score study. Grotendieck theorem. So Grotendieck, I think, conjectured this result in UGA or something. Rieskorn proved it for um, simply nice cases, and then Slotterdy did a, a general argument which allows you to prove this for, the origin, for general type. In fact, now I'm going to say what the result is. So let E be in the subregular no perfect orbit, and then we form an SL2 triple, HEF, and then the slowly slice is E plus the centralizer of F, which is a transverse slice uh, to the orbit through E. And if we take this transverse slice and intersect this with N, then the theorem says, is, is a simple singularity now simple singularities are known by various names Brannian Duval singularities for example and so it is of the same type as G. So what do I mean by it's the same type as G? I was mean, asked about this, uh, this uh, early this afternoon, so you can now try and explain. So the simple singularity is well known. So by definition, the simple singularity is a quotient of C2 by a finite subgroup of SL2. Um, And it's well known that the finite subgroups of SL2 are classified up to conjugacy according to simply laced thinking diagrams. So, Simple singularity is classified by these ADE diagrams. And what Slotovy did is he said, well, if you go outside of type of the simply laced cases and you look at the subregular no potent orbit, then the component group of an element of that orbit is non trivial. And so that's not true in the simply laced cases. And the component group of the subregular element, the non simply laced cases, group, is going to act on this slice. So this intersection. 
And that action you can include and sort of encode in your definition of a simple singularity, and you therefore extend the definition from the classification according to ADE diagrams by classification according to all of the uh, reducible root system. Uh, so, for example, we extend this by an outer action Uh, we extend this definition by including uh, the action of a finite group. So, for example, um, so the type BM singularity is a type A2A minus 1 with an action of S2. Type Cn is a type Dn plus 1 with an action of S2. Type F4 is D6 with an S2. And type G2 is D4 with an S3. Now, this diagram looks, so this list looks a little bit like the list that we've got above here. There's some differences. So, first of all, up above we have quotienting by the action of a finite group. And here we're including the action of a finite group on the singularity. And the other thing you notice is that whereas Bn here corresponds to A2n minus 1 with an action of S2 above, it was Cn which corresponded to the quotient of A2n minus 1 by S2. So that is related to what I said before about why you have to take the Langmans dual type so you swap the diagrams of type B and C to make everything match up. Right, I don't have very long left, so let me just um, uh, say the uh, question to Chasey. No, oh, I haven't even defined the singularity associated with the arbitrary pair. So in general, If we pick two orbits, there's O prime less than O, so contained in the closure of O, then the singularity associated to this pair is by definition section of the slightly slides to an element in the orbit down below with the orbit closure of the element above. So strictly by definition I mean the equivalence class of that singularity and here HBF is an SL2 triple with either of its O prime. This is the easiest way to think about these Singularities associated to say edges in the Hus diagram and the diagram for all of the special not over So just before I change board, perhaps of the chasing for various um, equivalences. various row and column <coughs> removal rules um, producing equivalences of singularities associated to such pairs all 
encoded in classical types. So what is the um, so everything I've said so far has been is quite old old history. So what's new? So the new thing here is that. Um, So we classified, so this is uh, Boa Food, Daniel Zito, who's in the front row, and Eric Summers, who was going to come with his, um, yeah, he's just become a father for the second time, so I think he decided it probably wasn't a great idea. Um, so, um, So our work classifies the singularities associated to adjacent pairs of orbits or special and potent orbits. An exceptional type. So you can have two orbits which are adjacent in the host set of special no potent orbits that aren't adjacent in the set of all no potent orbits. So we are in, we are interested in those cases. And some of the edges on this diagram include, include that. So here, for example, I've missed out lots of no potent orbits which aren't special, which fit between these. Okay. And should I move this over or, or Okay, I think rather than the keep carrying on writing, I'm just going to explain a bit of the story in relation to the diagram in F4. Now the red letters are giving you the type of the singularity which is associated to each edge here. And then as we just discussed, the edges... All the special orbits. Sorry? These are all the special orbits in type F4. And you can see that generally speaking, what happens is what we want to happen. So a simple singularity, which is denoted by an uppercase letter, is swapped with the corresponding minimal special singularity. The F4 goes to F4SP, and so on. Uh, and here we have a G2 goes to G2SP, A1 goes to A1. Of course, these are the same singularity, but I've used a lowercase letter just to show you that it's the same thing. And there's one exception. Sorry, there are two exceptions. Two exceptions are this C3, which gets sent to a funny thing, which is a minimal singularity with an action of a finite group. And then there's another exception, which is this epsilon here, which corresponds to four branches of type D4 acted on by a symmetric group S4. I don't really have time to explain what that is. The yellow circling is telling you something about Lustig's canonical quotient. And so essentially we have managed to come up with a rule. Eric Summers did this by looking at all of the cases. And the rule is that this correspondence, which the duality sends a singularity, a simple singularity of a certain type to a minimal special singularity of the same type, only breaks down in cases where you have a non-trivial action of the canonical quotient of the corresponding um, component. And so when that's at the bottom of your edge, here, for example, then we don't have the corresponding singularity down the line. So, uh, I don't think I can. Yes, yeah, I think I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Oh, 
<laughs> See if you can say what epsilon is. Epsilon, yeah, yeah. So I didn't say what epsilon is because I might have given the impression that we've that we've really established every case. But that's more or less true for the ordinary not open orbit. For the special orbits, we thought we'd proved this, and then we haven't talked about it for about two years. So I think this has to revert to the case status of being conjectural. Um, but we're sort of convinced that this um, singularity here is a quotient of a minimal d4 singularity by s4, not by s3, but by a bigger group which contains s3 as a quotient. So that s d4 over s4 is somehow coming from a sort of funny situation with the singularity at the bottom. Yep. Are there any more questions? If not, we thank Paul again. Thank